So <clears throat> for those of you that maybe haven't heard of some of the things I do, I work at um, Cognitech. I'm a contributor to Clojure. Uh, perhaps you've tried CoreLogic, which is like Prolog, but it's for Clojure. Or you've tried CoreMatch, which is like functional pattern matching, except it's for Clojure. Um, or ClojureScript, I'm the lead maintainer of ClojureScript, which is a dialect of Clojure. I compile to JavaScript. Um, so yeah, so I do a lot of stuff. Uh, I could, oh, I also work at Ohm. So Ohm is like this other thing that I work on, which is like a functional UI programming uh, by building a layer over React, which is an amazing library from Facebook for doing UI stuff in the web browser, uh, which I highly recommend checking out. And Ohm does, is more radical. It takes, it takes React and works on top of it and allows you to take advantage of persistent data structures um, in UI, which is cool. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about any of those things. I'm going to talk about something very mundane, uh, data. Uh, so if you do Lisp, you know that Lisp has this nice uh, property that people often re refer to as uh, homo-iconic, and that's because a Lisp program is a valid Lisp data, uh, Lisp data structure. Um, and uh, something that you encounter when you build real systems uh, is that the programming languages don't actually matter that much, because uh, you're usually tying together uh, completely different systems. You have to talk to somebody else's system, and who knows what that's written in, Amazon Web Services. Uh, or you have different teams working on different systems internally. You know, when I used to work at the New York Times, you know, things are written in PHP and Node.js, JavaScript, Java, uh, Ruby, and all these things have to talk to each other. Uh, so uh, there's a cool project, uh, which is one of my favorites, that, I, that actually I don't think gets enough attention. Uh, and it's called Transit. I'm actually going to use one of my coworkers' slides because they're pretty good. Uh, but I might at the end focus on things that I think are cool that I think people miss. I think uh, the transit got sort of overshadowed by transducers. Maybe, maybe some of you heard this. Raise your hand if you've heard of transducers. Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's a good amount of use. So transducers is, is pretty cool. They're, they are pretty cool. Um, but I think transit is, is even cooler in, in some respects because uh, it solves some hard problems when you're actually building real software. <coughs> okay. Let's get started. So this is just you know bridging language barriers to transit. Uh, at any point, this is like sort of a kind of an informal talk. If there's if you have a question, just raise your hand. It's fine. Uh, we can stop. Uh, there's no need to, to hold your questions until the end. All right. So transit. It's a, something that that uh, we released. I think uh, three months ago. Now. I think we released in the summer. Um, but what is transit? Transit is, is a format. It's a data format. And you're probably, if you haven't heard it, you're probably thinking, oh my god, another data format. It's a horrible idea. It might be. But uh, I'm going to try to convince you otherwise. Uh, and it, even if you have heard of it, what I want to convince you of is that it is actually extremely useful. Uh, and if you spend some time with it, I think you will want to use it. Um, so transit is both a format and it's a set of libraries. And we'll, we'll look at one in particular, because I actually worked on transit.js. So it's a format for exchanging values. Uh, classic problem is how do you get data from application A to application B? Yeah, 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 we know about this. Because uh, you have different languages. Um, I mean, the most basic example of this is uh, the fact that you have some server-side language and you have some client-side language. Uh, unless, right, does anybody here write full stack like JavaScript? Anybody? Well, it's a couple, there's a couple people, so two, but that's not that many. Um, so almost everyone is probably writing in some server-side language and must talk to JavaScript. It's just like basic problem. The server, whatever you're running on the server is different from the client. So you have to communicate with the client in some way. Uh, different environments, um, so you know, similar to different languages. All right, so there are some obvious solutions um, uh, to this. Uh, often what people have done, what you've seen happen is that JSON, which actually was like, I mean, the thing is I remember when JSON came out. JSON was invented like sort of what, discovered by Douglas Crawford, <laughs> uh, way back in uh, 2000. Uh, and actually, people, it was a joke. I mean, it was a comical joke. When I started doing um, front-end dev in 2005, everybody was doing XML. I mean, that's just, that was just the only game in town. Um, and really, JSON, JSON didn't take off until there were high-performance native parsers. Right? People used it for convenience, but it was only after um, high-performance parsers in C and C++ arrived that people started using it everywhere. Uh, because it has a lot of interesting properties. So it's funny, you have to start asking the question, why do people like JSON when they had uh, binary formats? Like, why did they start writing servers and services 
uh, to use JSON. I think there are lots of good reasons why this transition did occur. Um, but in any case, um, you had to have five fast parsers for people to actually take this stuff seriously. Uh, so what, one thing that's awesome about JSON, especially if you had to live through the nightmare of XML, is that you know it's, it's a lot less verbose, right? It's a lot easier to read um, because JSON has this nice lispy property, right? I mean, that was the thing that, that um, like Douglas Crawford discovered was that uh, JavaScript literals really work, really work as a data description format. It really just works. <coughs> um, and he sort of restricted it to a very specific set of, of, of JavaScript data literals. And you could basically, it used to be you would eval, you would skip the thing and eval, and that's of course a horrible idea. Uh, and you don't do that anymore. You can use JSON parts. But anyways, again, it's, it's, it's self-describing. That's what's cool about JSON. Uh, I'm sure you guys built JSON services. You can debug it pretty in a straightforward way. JSON's great. Again, just to reiterate fast, well understood. It's now available everywhere. And it really is. JSON parsers are, are um, surprisingly fast. Uh, much, I mean, I think much better than uh, even some of the best XML parsers these days. Okay, but there are lots of things that suck about it. So, you know, we've spent, I mean, how many, how many people here write JSON services? Okay, so that's, that's a good chunk of you. Um, so things that suck are like, um, it's a very restricted set of data that you can describe with JSON. So I can, six, six types, right? These are the only types that you have. Uh, that's it, done. Um, so string, you've only got floats, you've got boolean, null, array, an object. An object only supports string keys. Uh, so you can, you can make anything you want as long as it looks like this. And it, as you build systems, what often happens is that people start ending up doing lots of ad hoc things uh, because JSON is so limited. Um, so for example, I'm sure many of you have written this code before, right? It's a date encoded in some format as a string, but you have to communicate to your JavaScript developer, this is the format. And then somebody changes it and forgets to tell everybody. Um, that happens with Knowing the frequent level of frequency. Um, so this is super common. Dates are definitely like one of these cases where uh, you, it's all ad hoc. It's all made up. Everybody has to know what's going on. You have to communicate. There has to be a communication about what's the format of the thing. Um, and again, uh, fundamentally what was awesome about XML was that XML had baked in it, in its name, extensible markup language, right? Extensible. You, you, could, you could extend it. You could have your own, own um, uh, basic types. And this is not possible with JSON. There's no way to extend uh, JSON because you're only stuck with what you can represent in JavaScript. Um, I'm actually surprised that people haven't been like seriously pissed off about this uh, much sooner than now. Uh, the other thing that you encounter um, is that JSON is verbose, so it's very common to build a, a service and it, you can like, you know, JSON, almost every app, like for example, Amazon Web Services, if you can get it as XML, you can get it as JSON, and you're effectively writing a query to an API endpoint, and it returns you results, and these are encoded into an array in which you have these records, which are, you know, encoded as, as JavaScript objects, and then you're just repeating data over and over and over again because you have some uh, well-defined set of fields that each record must have. Right? This is super common uh, you, when, when people uh, create some sort of JSON service. So this stuff, redundant information. Um, so you know, so there, 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 all this stuff, you know, basically boils down to, you know, how do we, how do we, when I design a service, communicate to the people at the other side what they have to do. Uh, it's almost always unpleasant, like, you know, like when I look at like something at uh, like Amazon Web Service, you're just wading through docs about what is, what does this string actually mean, right? Because the string does not have enough information to determine this. So people end up doing, end up doing lots of ad hoc stuff. So what do you want? So, so at Cognitech, we, we, we of course encountered this problem along with everybody else, the same problem that everybody has, and we decided this is crazy, uh, we just want to fix it. Uh, and not only do we want to fix it, we want to make a format, we want to, we want to open source a bunch of libraries, and also make it easy for people to implement this thing um, that we know will have good performance because there are already high performance C-based uh, parsers for this. Uh, in browsers, 
uh, on, the, on the server side, it's everything <coughs> ready, ready to go. Uh, we actually also support message back, which I'll talk about in a second. For people that really just want the little extra bit of speed you'll get from a binary encoding. So we also wanted a rich set of types. We wanted what we did uh, to be extensible. Um, uh, we want support for types that we haven't thought of yet. So something that's really important when you do a data format, and if you have different environments, and the environments are old, are very loosely coupled, if I pass some custom piece of data to this service, and that passes it to another service, and then it comes back, I want that piece of data to, to be uncorrupted, right, untouched. No one should touch this thing, because just because B didn't know how to handle it, I should still be able to round trip that value. <coughs> So round trip ability is extremely important. And you want to be relatively efficient. Uh, we're, not, we're not trying to compete, again, we're not trying to compete with custom binary pro protocols. Uh, we want the reach of JSON, which means we're sort of piggybacking on JSON, uh, but we want to be as close to the performance um, of native JSON as possible. And we'll talk about, there's like a whole vast number of tricks that we use, and this is why I actually like this library, uh, because it was kind of a fun, performance things. Those of you that follow me, I'm a bit of a performance nut. Okay, so yeah, solve it once. So what if, you know, uh, we build on top of JSON, uh, we ship not just, not just the set of types that JSON has, but a whole bunch of other ones that everybody always uses. Uh, things like sets, uh, things like uh, binary blobs, uh, things like dates, um, lists, uh, link types, so those are your eyes into hypermedia. Um, all this stuff, we just ship it out of the box, and that all just, it all, it just works. Um, and maps, so also maps. So not just maps like uh, JavaScript objects, but real maps. Maps that support arbitrary keys. If I want to index, for example, I'm making a, a video app, and I want to return a, a map in which the keys are timestamps, that this should be um, transparent. I should be able to do this without any work, uh, which is really painful to do if you stick with JSON today. Uh, make it extensible. Make it fast and make it self-describing. So uh, transit doesn't talk about schemas at all. And in fact, it's not like it's anti-schema. It's just completely orthogonal. Uh, you can do schemas, but transit doesn't care. That's a separate thing. Okay. Uh, so, so the core data types. There's actually so there's more than this, and we'll talk about this. But you know, we're gonna have strings, booleans, nulls, uh, float, array, integers, and we're gonna support 64-bit integers because this is also an extremely common thing, right? Uh, so to, to those of you that are JavaScript people, so up to what representation can you represent integers in JavaScript? Who knows this? Can you tell? Your floats. And then, you know, it's actually valid in the spec. You can rep there's a, a certain size of integer that you can represent. Even though they're floats, the spec says you can represent an integer up to this dimension, this size. So, but you guys don't know, right? 64? No, no, it's it. No, no, 53 bits. Oh. 53 bits. <laughs> <laughs> totally arbitrary. Totally, ar totally arbitrary. Uh, and in fact, a hilarious thing happened. When I was at the New York Times, when I was at the New York Times, um, Twitter used to set up their, 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 their IDs as integers, right? And they, 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 they cross over across the 53 bit size, and then Twitter just broke. <laughs> completely broke. You would just randomly get some, some random status, right? Uh, so, so, so we want to be able to, it's very common to use 64 bit ints uh, in, in application, the design of applications, and so we want to be able to represent them. Uh, again, also coming from a data rich language like Clojure, um, or, or just more sensible languages. Well, that's like this includes Java, C++, C Sharp, Objective C. All these languages have like real maps with like complex keys. You can do this, but in JavaScript, your hands are tied. And this we found to be absurd. Go ahead. Is there a circular references? Or? There are no there are no references. No references. It's just data. You can't point from an object to some other object. This, I mean, this is the same as JSON. Okay. No decimal objects? I'm sorry? Uh, no decimal representation? Yeah, float in the binary. So yeah, we have we have we have we have decimal as well. We do. So we'll we'll talk about them in a second. Um, uh, so the, the nice thing, the nice thing is like if you start thinking about what we're trying to do, uh, since we're gonna actually encode this into JSON, and again, you can put message pack to the side, we're gonna do the same thing with message pack, but there's some benefits here, right? So uh, a JavaScript, a JSON string, 
it's going to be represented actually as a, as a, as a JSON string, right? Booleans are going to be represented in the same way. Um, null, nil, represented basically the same way. Numbers, and so on. So for the what we call the ground types, the types at the bottom, the ones that you're not providing, the custom types you might provide, uh, these actually, we try to keep these as, as closely mapped to a JSON as possible, because we don't want to do any more work than we, than we have to do. In fact, it's preferable that we can just say JSON parse, and we're done. Uh, but we have, uh, so up here, here's an example of a um, arbitrary precision integer. So we do have 64-bit ants, we, we can also do arbitrary precision. Um, there, are some, there are some special delimiters uh, which we can get into, but basically, uh, we'll, actually, let's talk about that in a second. But we have delimiters, and so what we do, so the thing is, we do use strings, and the tilde is, is the delimiter that lets us know that it's a special kind of string. Um, this is how we're able to have a larger set of types, is that we use strings, but we have a delimiter character followed by um, a single character that would describe which, which thing we're trying to encode. And, and again, we, we use these single character things because we want, part, again, parsing to be as simple as possible. Uh, but this does mean, so people often ask if you're thinking about this, so if, for example, if a tilde appears in a string, um, when we encode it, we have to um, escape it. So we know that that was actually originally a, a real tilde, and that's <coughs> the part of the format. Okay, so yeah, so here's some answers. So these, these are the other things you get. So we get off, I showed some basic stuff, but we get you get timestamps, we have UUIDs, we have URIs, hypermedia links, arbitrary precision ints, decimals, uh, bytes, which is it's like the binary information, uh, characters, set, list, maps with composite keys, and this is a very closure specific thing, but this is something that also commonless people understand. Uh, we, we, we want to be able to put um, keywords and symbols into our data structure. So we have a first class support for keywords on symbols. Uh, so yeah, and here's just some more examples. So again, the trick is, you know, tilde, uh, the character, this is the one for URIs. Um, so this is a this is a, uh, a more complex thing. So we go it's tilde hash set followed by um, the representation. So this is what's called a tagged thing. It's not a simple thing where it's like we can just parse the string. This needs to be something represented in some more complex way. Um, so whatever the value is for this particular tagged value, this must be a valid transit thing. So you can't you have you must define the tag thing in terms of transit values, and this supports um, a recursive parsing. Uh, so UUIDs <laughs> and timestamps. And these are just, you know, milliseconds since 1970 or whatever. <laughs> All right, your own extensions. So you can add your own. Oh, go ahead. Uh, can you give a couple of examples of symbols? What do you mean by symbols? Uh, symbols are symbols. So a symbol is a, it's a list thing, right? So. Uh, <laughs> Right, so a symbol in Lisp is, is often used to rep, like, so if I make a, a thing like this, if I go, this is a function, so this is a real function, this is syntax, but I could go like this, <coughs> and that's not, that's, that's nothing, it's just, it's, just, it's just a list with some symbols and some data structures in it. So the symbols are these characters that would normally be identifiers in your programming language, Except in Lisp, they're reified, right? So, in, in, for example, like in Java, you can't get you can't get to, you can't get at symbols. The symbols are a part of the thing. It's just it's just it's, it's not reified. It's not something you can manipulate. But that's not true in Lisp because you you have macros and syntactical transformations that are really simple. Uh, you need a reified symbol type. Does that hopefully answer your question? So, in 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 in, in Java, uh, a symbol would be like I can actually get this, the thing that represents the word class. Right? I would actually be able to manipulate it as a piece of data, but that's not really possible. Okay. And so this is just showing a recursive example. So again, so imagine I want to I want to extend transit. I want to represent employee records, right? And I, and I, what I want to do is I have, I'm programming in Ruby, and I have an employee class. I have an employee class, and I want to be able to go transit and code, and I want to get this, which is a tagged value. 
Um, it contains an array, which this could be this could be the arguments that you pass to the employee constructor on the JavaScript side, and you'll take a name and it'll take um, a, some a timestamp. And what I'll get in JavaScript is an employee object with the name field set and the timestamp set. And I don't have to explain to the JavaScript programmer what to do. This just will construct the right thing, and all the values will get parsed and set correctly. So this is about this is about eliminating any ad hoc coordination. As long as the server has the handler to encode employee and the client has the handler to, to decode, you're good to go. You don't have to explain anything to the user um, about how to what they have to do. Um, so the other cool thing we do uh, is we I'm sorry this is a typo scalar. So Transit does another really awesome thing in that since we want to uh, send back large payloads that might be results, uh, we automatically cache scalar keys. So every time we encounter a string, for example, in an object, we will actually replace them with cache codes. Uh, and this actually can, uh, you know, for very large payloads, you can get like 40% reduction in the size of the uh, a JSON that you send. So this is what it looks like. So here is uh, a record. So we'll talk about the array representation in a second, but this is actually a map. It's a way. It's a, we actually uh, uh, um, encode maps as arrays because it's actually faster to parse. We'll talk about the format stuff later. But so the first time we encounter the key name and the key hire, these are key value pairs. We'll leave that alone. But if we ever account encode that again, we're going to say um, we cached name or we cached hire. And this, um, as the size of your payload increases, <coughs> you start saving tons of space. Uh, so, no free lunch. So, actually, as due to me, so when I started working on Transit JS um, or Transit JS, even though the Transit spec was evolving, initially it was more oriented around just readability out of the box. Um, it's because of our desire to get reasonable performance, so we could, you know, so people will be encouraged to adopt it. Um, by default, it's not about readability. It's just how fast can we parse it in JSON? How fast can we uh, encode and decode? Uh, but we actually have a really nice thing where you can actually take any, any transit payload and say you want the verbose um, encoding. So it's actually pretty trivial. Who here, does anybody here use JSON view in Chrome for these JSON extensions? So they're awesome, right? Because you can take anything, <coughs> will automatically pre-print, and you'll get you'll be able to collapse and blah, 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 blah. So I have an experimental thing where it's just it's just a Chrome extension that can intercept the transit payload, it decodes it, and then reprints it back out in verbose mode, the same way as JSON view works. So this is easy to do. Uh, so again, it's not it's not human readable by default, but it's just one it's one little option, and boom, you have um, a readable JSON payload. Okay, so uh, readers and writers need to understand extensions. So this, again, so this is. Um, you have to coordinate on both sides. Again, if you forget, if you forget, you get round tripping for free, but in order to get all the benefits, you have to have the same set of readers um, and handlers on both sides. Uh, and again, uh, reading an unknown extension <coughs> is not a error. Okay, so this sounds might sound cool, but um, it's not that cool if you don't have a lot of libraries that understand this, right? If you want, if you want people to adopt this thing, you have to ship uh, with the libraries that let you do this. Uh, so actually we shipped um, a lot over the summertime, Clojure, ClojureScript, Java, JavaScript, works both in uh, the browser, works in under Node.js, Ruby, Python. Open source things include OCaml, Erlang, Haskell, um, Scala. Sc Scala, Go, uh, I think Objective-C. Uh, so and again, the reason the reason the reason so many popped up so quickly is because the spec is you're just it's just on top of JSON. So if you could spend you could literally bang out a one for your language in probably a couple days. The spec is very well defined. It's really straightforward. We have a bunch of tests. It's easy to verify your implementation. Um, and again, you just have to generate JSON, so it's pretty easy to do. And this was also something that we uh, was a goal. Uh, so let's let's look at how this works. So. Uh, if you want to play around with transit, you can actually, when you use JavaScript or you have Node installed, it's actually really easy. Uh, here I have it, uh, this in my directory, um, and I just did npm install transit.js, and go like this. Boom, I have transit. I can go, I can make, a, uh, let's make a writer first. So I can go t, 
writer. Again, we don't have we don't have message pack for, for for transit yet. It's just JSON. But you can imagine one day when message pack performance in JavaScript is actually good, we would have this. But here we have a writer, and I can write this. So first off, what? Uh, so this is a, a very subtle point. Can you? So. But is that actually a valid JSON value? No. It's not. It's not actually a valid <laughs> JSON value. Right? The only thing that's valid is an object or an array. And, and there's actually, it's a bit tricky. Uh, some of the implementations don't even allow arrays. So, so when you call stringify, um, that actually is not something you can send over the wire. You can't send this over the wire. Well, Go ahead. I think there are two things to state here. In the first place, programmers are really stupid about programming. And the second thing is, any, any Haskell cranks here? That thing is obviously a type error. <laughs> I mean, obviously. <laughs> right, this is the repetition of what I said before. <laughs> so it lets you do this, but you can't, you can't send this over the wire. <laughs> That's why they call it um, object to string JSON. Yeah. Like yeah. So imagine I want to send just a number over the wire, and this works. So we, so we automatically say it's a quoted thing. In the classic list file, it's a quoted thing. And this will, when it gets read on the other side, it'll just get unquoted. So you can send, you can send single values across the wire. It just works. Um, I don't, it's so funny. It's like, this sounds like a simple thing, but I've made this mistake on many occasions. And you can't act like, this is not, this is not valid JSON. Yeah, exactly. That's not valid JSON. You can't send that. <laughs> why do they call it? Why do they? What's, what's the real one? It's called JSON dot really stringify. That's standard. No, there's just no thing. There's just no thing. thing. There's no thing. I'm telling you, the programmers' <laughs> insight into programming and computers is so great. Yeah. That's why most people run Windows. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> so okay, so that's cool, and uh, I can I can take the regular stuff. I can go w right like this. I can get uh, that. That looks just like a you know, whatever JSON encoded array. It gets a little bit more interesting if you do this. So, like so. And this is what I was talking about. So maps are encoded in this way. Um, but let's imagine. Let's imagine I want to debug this. I can always go. Writer, you can kick the payload. So often when, I'm, when you're debugging, you'll be like right there, make a verbose writer, and then it'll just, it'll just print out um, the most readable thing. Uh, again, the reason we do it this way, it's, it's in, like under V8, just by, uh, and, it's, and, it, and the performance is better everywhere. It's better across the board, but under V8, uh, arrays parse twice as fast as objects. So it's a 50% it's a 50 performance increase to use arrays uh, as, you're, as you're encoding. Yeah. I have a question. Okay. Um, so, like in the uh, previous thing, the foo bar, right? Um, so the foo is wouldn't that be like a symbol? So, like, okay, it's it's, it's mapped as a string, but how do you know? Ah, uh, so sorry. I'm sorry. String? So I should have done the long form. I mean, uh, again, uh, technically, this is implicit that there's quotes, double quotes around this in okay. JavaScript. This is implicit. It, this, is, this is a string key. It's, oh, just, it's just sugar that I can write it this way. Okay. But that is actually must be a string key. Okay. Like, like this is this is not gonna work, right? If I go like this, well, of course it. You know, that does, that's not that's not right. So, uh, <laughs> so let's do this. The other the other cool thing that we do. Uh, so who here knows what ES6 is? ES6. So, oh, this is great. So people, so it's the web. So people know. So ES6 has this awesome thing called map and set. So it's like, yes, I know it's 2014. Sets and maps are finally coming to JavaScript. <laughs> um, it's pretty crazy. Uh, but so what we did is that we actually wanted maps and sets today. We didn't want to wait for the engines to implement them. So I actually, uh, so uh, the coolest thing about transit.js, and this isn't true for the other ones, because they don't need to do this, because they're written on top of more sensible languages. But uh, Transit actually ships with ES6 and ES, uh, ES6 compatible maps and sets, and we actually have um, um, an extensible way to talk about equals and hash code. 
which are the two operations you need to extend um, maps and sets, because you need to be able to describe how does this value hash. You don't need to worry about this because all, all the values that I already talked about, we already have hashing inequality defined. So everything out of the box, the semantics are already well defined for that. You only have to do it if for some reason um, you want some custom thing. But even out of the box, it's just going to work, but it's better, um, for those of you that understand that, to define equality and hashing. But anyways, so we can do this. So I can go T, I can go map. So here I can make a map, uh, and we basically encode them as arrays. Right? And it's just a data structure, whatever. Uh, but this is not, uh, and you can ignore this, this does give away some of the secrets, but you notice that it, has, it keeps the array internally and it gets more sophisticated, it becomes a real hash map later. Uh, but this is a real data structure and it actually is a real uh, numeric key. So I can go M get, and this is exactly the same as ES6, right? I can actually say give me the value that's, that's encoded for one. But it gets way cooler. If I can go to tmap, and this again, this is not cool if, you, if you're already working in something that's not JavaScript. But I can encode. <laughs> <laughs> so here I have um, an array, right? As that's a key. The key is, is a composite key. And I can say, um, just works. Wow. And, that, and that works because we've already defined hashing inequality for arrays, objects, strings, dates. Everything. So that's that's built in. It's just it's just standard. Um, but this is even cooler, I think. So I want to go new date. Well, actually, let's do this. So we have a date, right? I can go equal T map. I go T far. I go map get D. So it's a date. And so I can encode that on the wire and give it to somebody and they can decode that or iterate it. So you can do everything. So this, these, things, these things support iteration. You can go for each. You can do the ES6. Give me the, the, the iterator. All that stuff works. Go ahead. Try it again. Just press the up arrow key to again. But that's because D oh, is stored in your very No, 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 no. no, no, no. <laughs> okay. So, what happens if we go um, R right M? Boom! Right? What? All right. This, this is a map. So maps start with this special two, two character thing. There's our first key and there's, there's bar. But really, this is what matters. So if I go, if I make a reader like this, and I go R read R uh, right M, Get D. This is this this is what this is what you want. I'm going to encode that thing. I'm going to read the string back out, and this better work, right? I should be able to get that date, the date that I saved in the variable, right? It just, it just works. It just works. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like this, but it actually works. The quote of the day. So. Um, so we spent a lot of time. This was actually this was an incredible amount of time, and we spent like uh, I probably spent three months on this, uh, getting it right. Uh, and again, we use it. We we we're building stuff with it, and we really like it. Uh, and it's quite fast. And I'll show you uh, a little benchmark here in a second. Um, but you can do you can, all this stuff. Go ahead. Um, I just want, why don't, a question. When you have like a reader or a writer, you pass in the string JSON. Is the idea that you can also encode these things in other? Format. Yes, so in the future you may be able to do this. Um, that might happen. Okay. So we're, we're waiting. The reason we're waiting on this, the only reason we're not doing binary is that binary um, parsing strings out of the binary data mm -hmm. is too slow. It's too slow. And there yeah. needs to be native support for this. Mm -hmm. uh, so and it turns out that mess that message pack is actually four to five times slower to parse than JSON. Mm -hmm. So fingers crossed, hopefully they achieve parity eventually, yeah. and then eventually it's faster. And then what's great about this is that you won't have to change your transit code. Yeah. You have to change the readers, just the where you create the readers, but the, all the code will just work. Yeah. And you will be binding instead of is there, it, for, for this particular library, is it like um, open to create other formats? Like for example, if someone wanted to put this stuff uh, on top of like Seabor or... 
Uh, yeah, there's, no, there's, there's nothing stop. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. Though I think you'll end up having the most fun when it's something like message back or JSON, where where the uh, the semantics of the thing that you're writing yeah. to allows you to do arbitrary stuff without a schema. Mm -hmm. So. Right, we don't. We wouldn't have to like. JSON doesn't require a schema. It's easy to encode to. Yeah. Message pack is like JSON, but it's binary. Mm -hmm. There's no schema you have to talk about mm -hmm. in order to encode it. Um, and that's it's, it's nice. It's simple. Yeah. Are you playing with the concept of a schema to align with it? <clears throat> nope, we're not. We're not. We're not doing this at all. And again, uh, people have started doing that. That part of it. We're not going to work on it. Uh, we sort of. This is just the thing that we ship. Um, and we are not going to do the schema thing, but it's not like we're discouraging people from doing the schema thing. You can do that if you want. This is not anti-schema by any means, right? It's just you have to bring your own thing. Uh, any any other questions about this before? I... Um, in terms of like the hashing of objects, if you had like an object with the same, like say name, and then it was changed, and you made a second object with or with that same value repeat, and with I uh, yeah. So I know what you're about to ask, which is so. So if in ES6 maps, which, which totally sucks in my opinion, it's based on object identity. Okay. So if I make an object and I change the keys and I use it in a in a map or a set, mm -hmm. then I can only get back to that value with the original object, right? If I try to supply some other map with the same the same set of keys, the original thing. It won't work. So uh, in transit, it's always based on whatever the value was of the object was when you encoded it. Okay. It's not based on identity. Okay. It's based on values. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, other questions about this? Well, Lisp also has a solution for that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's right. OK. Uh, I could show more things, but I think I want to show talk about some other stuff. How does this relate to even? So, so Eden, it does relate very close to Eden. So Eden is the um, it's the closure data loop. So it's it's what it's like JSON, but it's which what JSON is to JavaScript, Eden is to closure. Uh, Eden has actually almost all the properties that we talked about in terms of extensibility and rich set of data types and blah blah blah. blah. Let me rephrase my question. So yeah. if you if you have closure on the server so the script on the client, would you use this or Eden? I would use this. You would use this. Yeah, because the, the main thing you encounter with Eden is that there's no fast Eden parser. Like, closures is one of the fastest, and it's actually not that fast. It's actually pretty slow. Um, so anywhere where I would use, where I would be exchanging data, where I would have used Eden, I would just use this, because it's the same value propositions, like all the same properties. Um, but I'm not even kidding when I say 30 times faster. It's 30 times faster. OK, so. So we saw a little bit of what it looks like to use. Well, let me let me show um, well, let me show one more one more thing before we move on. So this I also think is pretty nice. Uh, so if I go, so. And I can go, um, so there's a set, and I can set that over the wire, and that has you know, the maps and the numbers and all this other stuff, and this just works. Okay. Right? So again, this is based on values, but not on identity. So I constructed a new JavaScript object, and I say, did that uh, JavaScript, the value exist in the set. OK. So yeah, so hopefully that makes sense. Uh, transit the format for exchanging values is built on JSON message pack. Again, it does trade off the readability out of the box for efficiency, for sensibility. That's available for closure script, uh, closure, closure script, JavaScript, Java, Ruby, and Python. Um, and I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about, so this is something I think people haven't heard of, is just so all the tricks we do to make it performant. Um, so one thing that I talked about was this, right? The fact that we encode everything as arrays. And so hash maps are represented as arrays. So does anybody know, uh, so this is a trick from Clojure. Uh, and actually it's a trick if you're doing any high performance hash map implementation. So what do people actually do for hash maps when you don't have that many entries? When you don't have that many entries. Hey, so let's say you put it into a system. 
exactly. So that, that is a trick that almost everybody does. As for small hash maps, it's, you can do as much benchmarking as you want. Yeah. It'll be faster to encode it as, a, as an array. Yeah. Like you, you provide the interface of a map, but you actually have an array underneath. Yeah. It's faster than doing all the hashing. Yeah, yeah. You, can, you can just do a quality checks and do a scan. Um, but this actually works out beautifully for the array encoding. Mm -hmm. So when we encounter a map, all we have to do is drop the first thing and wrap this. Um, That's all that we have to do. So, so, so actually, in many cases, um, like you'll see weird things where sometimes in um, under V8 will be like will be slightly faster than JSON parsing, but that doesn't make any sense because we are constructing keys and dates and all this stuff. So it's the same logical payload, and we can parse that just slightly faster and hydrate everything. Uh, again, that's because for objects, we can simply wrap arrays, because the encoding allows us to do this. Um, in, in most common list implementations, the trade-off is usually around 20 elements. Yep. Um, and I don't see that there's actually an advantage to arrays or lists in this case, because you have to traverse. It's a linear search, right? It doesn't really matter, yeah, yeah. but okay. the, the reason to use arrays is that that's the fast, that's what, that's what's fast in JavaScript. There's no, there are no lists in JavaScript. Yeah, right, right, okay, okay. got it. Got it. Uh, so the other, the other cool game you can play, so, so another thing that's kind of fun that, that people don't know about the um, Transit JS is that we do an even cooler trick in that we wait until 32 entries uh, because it's very common to, in the JavaScript world to, re, uh, to get like fairly large objects and after a bunch of testing with different like uh, JSON services in the wild, we, I decided that 32 is a good sort of set of key value pairs before we convert into real maps. But there's a cool trick where if you have something that's like 30 key value pairs uh, in a thing, it will actually represent as an array, but if you access it more than a few times, like if you have to do more than a few scans, we'll dynamically convert it into a real hash map. Because right. if it's in a hot spot, um, yeah. we, want, we just want to change the representation. Yeah. But it's completely transparent. You don't even know this is going to happen. If your thing becomes something that's in a hot loop, we convert to a hash map. Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, one other question. Uh, so like here you're creating a lot of like, I guess, transit data types. I guess, are these, uh, I guess, these data types are probably immutable? Or are they, they No, 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 so, so they are not, they're not, they're not, I mean, of course numbers, anything that's immutable in JavaScript yeah, yeah. is immutable, but out of the box, the maps and sets that we ship are immutable. Okay. Right? Well, they're immutable. Well, I, I thought I understood you to say, not only are they immutable, but they're cross-object immutable. No, no, no. So no. The, the way that we the, the, remember va value and set lookup is based on sorry. Uh, map and set lookup is based on value and equality. Right. That is true. But the okay. thing that the maps and set you get are uh, are mutable. Okay. But so there's a, there's another cool thing is that in ClojureScript this is not true. In ClojureScript for maps and sets and all these other things we actually use um, persistent data structures. Mm -hmm. So if you're if you're a consumer of transit from ClojureScript. Everything is immutable. Mm -hmm. It's all immutable. Um, but there's an, a really there's an even better thing, which is that. So let, let me let me just show this bit. So who here has heard of immutable JS? A few of you. Okay. Pretty cool library. So I wrote a blog post, which I recommend reading. So I one of the very first things I did when immutable JS came out, I was like, um, there's absolutely now that transit exists. There's absolutely no reason to, like, the first problem you're going to have with the immutable JavaScript library is how do I send that to the client? How do I get that there? It doesn't matter if you have the data structure library if you can't transport it. So this, this example actually has code showing that, like, this is all the code that we need uh, to decode uh, to get the immutable JS values. So this is awesome. You can write JSON. Like, you can say, you can say write this as JSON, but at the other side, we can get back immutable JS data structures. Uh, and so, like down here, like after you've installed, these are the handlers. So I didn't, I didn't get into it because it's, a, you know, it's a little bit, you know, requires a little bit, a little detail. But I recommend reading this later. So you can go from JSON directly into uh, vector and map, and we, and it's uh, pretty cool in that. So <coughs> immutable JS actually adopts the transient trick. So if you know closure. Closure has this um, notion of batch updating. You can take uh, immutable value in O1, convert it to something you can batch update, and then in O1, convert it back. 
So we actually do this. We will, we will, when we construct the thing, we'll, we'll build it as fast as possible, and then we'll convert it back. So it's not just a way to get immutable JS. It's a way to get immutable JS to your client as fast as possible. So we do the fastest thing. Uh, okay. Uh, I think. Uh, wait. Maybe. Do I have anything else? Really? Uh, I think. Oh, yes. Yeah, so let's look at this. One last thing, and I'll be done. So another little tour that I that was kind of fun is this thing that I wrote called Transit Tour, which is a little interactive JavaScript application. And actually, let's fire up our pal Chrome for this guy. Okay. So I, if you want to like review all the things I talked about, I wrote a whole tutorial where it actually goes through every single step, um, but at a much I would probably slower pace. And you can click, and you can see, you can click, and you can eval something, and it'll show you the output. So this is also proof that it doesn't work just in Node. The exact same thing is working right here in the browser. Right? We ship a browser-compatible version of the thing. So here I can go, like, these are, these are two dates, right? Two encoded dates. I can go eval. Boom, I get JavaScript dates. Um, so on. Uh, but let's skip down to... Uh, so this is, this is also fun. Just just. To show one more example, uh, I want I want to encode a point. So in constructors in JavaScript or just functions, whatever. Uh, but I want to be able to represent points on the wire. So this is a tag value where I where the the, the, the representation is encoded as an array. And I can click like this. So I can so I can if I want to represent geometry, I can do this naturally by uh, providing custom handlers. So so this this is what corresponds. This tag corresponds to a handler. Right, so it's, a, it's a map of handlers, and it will invoke this function um, when it encounters it. Uh, same for right handlers. So this is the right side. So here, when we get a point, we can basically uh, say, these are the handlers, and it, this allows us to go from constructor to handler. Uh, when we write it out, we say, what's the tab? We're going to return a point. The representation on the wire is an array, so we return an array with a field. Um, there's no string representation for this. It doesn't really matter. And then we should see, I should be able to encode an array of, of points. And that's it. And so it's, it's actually very, it's very succinct to um, write handlers for all the types that you care about. Let's just see caching. So just real quick, again, so here is a, obviously a, a, an array of objects where you have a ridiculous number of uh, redundant information. It's absurd, right? You're just repeating all this stuff. Um, so this is, this is simply showing the size of the transit string, string versus the JSON string. So this is with these things collapsed into their um, cached version. It looks like this. Right? So the first time we see user ID, you get this. The second time we replace it with the cache code. So let's see how this plays out on something that's real. So this is an 89K JSON. JSON. So there's two things I'm showing here. One is um, without caching. So that's how big the JSON payload would be without caching. This is how big it is with transit, it's caching. So just to make sure that this is not the same. So in this case, when we parse, we're just parsing JSON. This transit read actually is uh, constructing keywords and all these custom data structures. So it's really not actually doing the same thing. Uh, so how long does it take? So this, this should be pretty shocking, right? Mm -hmm. This is JSON parse. We know that transit must do way more work. Like 200 <laughs> milliseconds slower. It's not, it's not going to matter. Um, the, the performance is not quite as good in, in, in Safari and Firefox. But again, we built lots of applications. The difference is, not, is like basically negligible. And if you actually did all the work of going through and hydrating everything, uh, it would be horrible. You, your performance would not be that good. So here, for example, is like uh, JSON actually has, you can provide a hydrate function. Uh, and, that, and this is without doing any work. It's already a, a huge perfect to even install a hydrate. So our approach is just, again, um, it allows us to get the expressivity, but we are not um, losing on perfect. What's the uh, third benchmark? Oh, so this is fun. So this is what I was showing. This is this is the benefit of, of encoding everything as arrays and cache and with all the caching, because the payload is smaller and it's arrays. So this payload is 89k. It's just JSON parse. 
This is just JSON parsed just on the transit JSON. Mm -hmm. So this parses in, in this amount of time. So it only takes like point, you know. Uh, I see the two. Yeah, yeah, it's only six. Types. Types. It's only a, break yeah, it's only as they are, right? Exactly. It's only six tenths of a millisecond to, after parsing yeah. to hydrate it. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Are you? Is TransJS actually using JSON parse on that train and then processing that data, or is it processing? No, no. So that's what that's what that's why these numbers should be impressed here because we actually call parse and then recursively descend into the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. So parse is the very first thing that happens. Uh, so that's it. Um, well, hopefully I'll get these slides up somewhere. There's lots of there's lots of there's a, a Google group. Um, there's the original blog post. Uh, there's all these implementations. You can they're all fun to use. And there's the spec. So if you're like I want to implement this in common list for scheme, um, you can just follow the spec uh, and do that. Yeah. So what happens? Uh, the number of uh, number of elements in the object doesn't match the number in the constructor in the uh, the case where you define you do the extended data type. No, no. So, so you can cons you, so it's arbitrary. We don't invoke the constructor for you. That might not have been clear. Okay. So you can do that invocation yourself. So, so because we can't guess, we can't know what that's going to be. So the handlers are, are again. That's the trade-off. You have to write the handlers. And those will have to be written, uh, the, the encoder when your server side language and the decoder in the host language on the client. So that what has to be done. So it's subject to whatever the error handling properties of the <coughs> language are. No, no, no. No, 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 no. So we don't, again, we don't invoke the constructor. So that means right. it's just. When you do it, it will be subject to those things. When you do it, yeah. it will be subject <laughs> to those things. Yes. <laughs> So when would you want to define your own types and transit? So for me, there's lots of cool things. Like something that I've, you know, that I've always wanted to do is like it'd be awesome to represent, for example, RGB values on the wire. That's like something that'd be really cool. Uh, another one is like for anybody doing geospatial stuff. Like if you look at these libraries, it's so crazy. Like GeoJSON is the big thing, but you have to like use GeoJSON and it does everything for you, and you have to use the library. Um, but there are so many other domains that would really benefit from shared um, domain knowledge, like shared domain representation. Right, right, right. That's why people did GeoJSON, is they want, we should have one domain representation that any library can build off of. Uh, but it kind of sucks because that's, that's a walled garden. Um, and the idea with transit is that this is just too beneficial. So if, you, if we have shared domains, we can talk about them and we can just, it just works, right? <laughs> So if you had your own, um, if you had your own data shape, like you know, a bunch of nested maps with particular keywords and stuff, would it be abusing transit's functionality to find your own type for that? No, no, not at all. Not, not all? Okay. No, no, no. So, so okay. you, if you want to install a handle, you want to use a completely different representation for maps. If you want, I want ray maps, like right. you know, ray, yeah. ray, ray's maps. Right, you, know, right. you could, you could do that. There's no, okay. there's nothing stopping you from doing this. Okay, okay, but that, and that would be a legitimate. It wouldn't be like an overkill or an abuse of it. It wouldn't be an overkill. And the beautiful thing about this is that when you construct that thing, the custom thing you want to construct, the, the piece of data that you're going to get is already completely hydrated. Right? It's already ready to go. You just have to construct your thing. There's, you, don't have to, you don't have to descend recursively into okay. that thing at all. Because you now have a way of defining schemas in a way with decoders and encoders, right? Right. Okay. right. Okay. I think back there, there was. Uh, I was going to ask, but I just kind of answered myself. There's no need for a linter for this. No, 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 no. Like a lint, like a linter for the format. Yeah. Like if you're. Mad. Oh no, no, no. So that's that's the thing because we don't, you don't, you don't write it by hand. So JSON right. has this thing where you write it by hand, yeah. right? You really do write it by hand. Where here, what we want to do is we're like, no way, no, we're not going to write this stuff by hand. You can if you want, and it, it will, it will work. But usually, what happens is that on the server side, you've constructed some graph of your objects, and you're calling JSON stringify. You're not writing data literals because you're writing it out of a database. Right. You know. There is there is a, a point though to what I'm saying, which is if you're going to store this stuff into the database and string on parse format, if your format evolves, no, no, no. no so, so you know how stable is the format definition at this point? So we definitely rec do not recommend using it as a, as a persistent thing. No, you should not use this as a persistent thing. Somebody's 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, no, it's, it's hilarious because, like, you bring, you bring that up, and the very, like, the second line or something is like, do not use this as a persistent format on disk. You should not do that because, yes, you may very well may change uh, the details of, of, of what's the actual representation of the wire. Is. But, yeah, good point. Uh, there, Did you ever, uh, or are you maybe imagining being able to send decoders over the wire? No, because no, he has a sending arbitrary computation. I mean, that's just a can of worms. That's But it's very little work. And we've actually, again, we're building systems. And, you know, for us, what's great is that, you, I mean, you, it's a massive set of types that you get out of the box. And for most data oriented applications, um, the set of types that we ship are good enough. Uh, in fact, I, I like, I, initially when it came out, people wanted to, like, use it as, like, Object serial, like actual object serialization, and I'm like, yeah, you can do that, but it's kind of abusing the sort of data centric approach that we, we tend to adopt, at least in the, in the closure world. Can you register new types that say that I have a type and I can define it with some constructors as, as you need them, as you need it? Can I register for a type to be automatically serialized in that? Like define types on the fly and install handles on the fly? Well, you require a library, and then you say, okay, here I have these two types, and they will hook some interface. And now, when I serialize it, and now you do the right thing, you just invoke the method. Does that make any sense? Uh, we have support for doing that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, mean, I think I know what you're saying. But you, essentially, I'm saying you provide 15 types. You know, what if I want to have a, set, a 16? That, but that's what I just said. You can always extend it. I mean, that was the, those points, the examples of points and stuff. Those are built in. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. The, the whole, the whole value proposition is that I, we have our fifteen, and you have hundreds. You can, you can bring all those to the system. I think. Is your blog on those resources? I'm sorry. Is your blog on those resources? No, my blog is not on this list of resources. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's pretty easy. My handle on Twitter is like SwanoDebt. It's just swanodebt.github.io. Okay. Yeah, just... Getting back to the, the thought of um, persistent data format, huh? what would you use? And, and the reason I'm asking is one of the many uses of JSON is as a persistent format, like yeah, data, yeah. like GeoJSON. Configuration settings like the package.json file. So, so, so what I just want to throw out there is like the funny thing about this, right, is if you really want a persistent data format, um, it generally um, the host languages usually has, has a good serialization story. So, in Clojure, transit is not a thing. It's just it's just a library that we use on disk. We store Eden because Eden is a stable thing, and we're just going to save it, save that. We read it, and then I want to send it to a, a Clojure script client, and then I go transit write, and I go transit read. Mm -hmm. But that what we stored on disk was some other format that's better for that, and that that is fine. Whatever the native, host whatever host whatever host. the host. You, you want to be like, I want to go from YAML to something else. You can, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. And I, I think most people are doing that. They they have some other thing that they that's more natural for the language. They're really using transit just as conveyance. Mm -hmm. So transit's really not about like data on disk. It's just like how do we get the same semantic value from point A to point B to point C? It's for transit. Exactly right. <laughs> Can you define your own types that are like the shorter ones you have? Like, so you have tilde n, and that's your date. No, so so the single letter types we could, because that's obviously a small set of characters. Uh, no, those are reserved. Those are reserved. You have to use tags. So it's tilde hash and some arbitrary string, and you can revive. But something that came up that I think would be great, and it still hasn't happened, is again, like for example, I would love to see people like start defining like in the same way that GeoJSON does this, like you know, geo slash point, like that's a string and everybody disagrees on what that means. Semantically, of course, anybody can implement the, the constructors for those in whatever way they want, but I think it would be huge to like have a series of standard tags uh, for the types of data that people want to share. Um, I think it would be awesome, like mm -hmm. RGB slash X, RGB slash whatever, you know, RGB slash, or color, color slash X, or color slash RGB, color slash RGBA. Like there's a lot of fun things you can do, and I actually suspect that people are doing them um, already in like their applications. But it would be cool to see people start sharing um, cool. their their you know the types of the care about. 
Is there any place where there are like libraries of people publishing formats that they've made in transit? In, in the beginning, again, people started talking about this, and I think it was again what happened was like I think it was a bit unfortunate. Like it was like transit came out and people were just like scratching their heads and just slowly starting to get it, which is why I, I talk about today. So I think people should revisit it. But then transducers came out right there, right there after, <laughs> and like people just forgot. Uh, uh, but yes, actually, somebody actually contacted us pretty early on. They wanted to like collect schemas. I think it's a great, I think it's an awesome idea. Uh, but nobody's actually, you know, that idea hasn't resurfaced yet. So no one has a public API that can be consumed with a transit vehicle. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, like. No, 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 people are already doing this. So, so, so well, transit. Other people can see. Anybody so people are already doing, yeah, yeah, people already do this thing, which is that, so we actually have um, the content type. It's, I believe it's application slash transit plus, J, transit plus JSON. So, so it's, I mean, I think people often were, were saying like, oh, this is so crazy. I'm like, no, it, what do you, like I worked in Rails for like four years and Rails has this really nice pattern. You, you define a resource and you say, you're going to return HTML, or JSON, and you just or XML, and you just call the right encoder for all these refs, right? You just have to have a new one called, you know, transit, mm -hmm. and then boom, your your endpoint is transit ready, and whoever wants to consume it can. So actually, providing a, a transit service is like it's, tri it's like almost trivial, right? You just have to include transit and just encode it. Okay. Are you planning to uh, register it in IETF as a real Miami? Uh, Oh, we should do that. I don't know if there's any discussion. I'm always just supposed discussion. to use the next in front of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't think we've done that yet, but that's a great idea. And, yeah. No, no. I think it's yeah, good thing to work on. I think we were, you know, a lot of it's just we want more people to use it. I mean, that's the other thing is like uh, we're using it and it fits our needs, but I think a lot of it's like, you know, what what else are we missing? Like something that something that I would like something that came up was like, yeah, it's an amazing idea. Uh, so right now, data formats, for example. Uh, don't have a good way to talk about metadata. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's going to be awesome. This is why we haven't like said this is exactly the representation. Uh, mm -hmm. Metadata is really cool if you're used to Clojure where you can put metadata on anything. Yeah. It's really mm -hmm. powerful. Um, and it would be awesome to have that as part of the specification. Mm -hmm. Like, I can say this thing has metadata. I don't affect its value or the quality semantics, mm -hmm. but I can read that out. Yeah. Right? And that would be super cool. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be great if the data format supported it, but it doesn't. It doesn't mm -hmm. yet. Um, but again, we need people to use it to yeah, say, yeah, sure. I love transit, I, I really want metadata now. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So speaking of that, like JavaScript object, you can't define internal properties and then have a reader spit out like a frozen object or an object that is in the new world, new world or something like that. Like say if I had an object and I said, is an overall false, and then it's read back and then that object. Right, you can't describe the data. Again, you can't, you can't, you can't put these side properties. You can't describe that part of it. It's just data. Um, again, it's something to. My experience is that number one, transit is, eliminates all these problems, and once those problems disappear, mm -hmm. you start thinking, I want now that that I see what it gives me. There are other things that I want, but that really requires people to use it, understand its limitations, and start getting, you know, on the Google group and start saying. This is this is really great. We want to we want to push it further. Um, uh, I'm just sort of curious. You said that it's got keywords and symbols. Uh -huh. uh, since JavaScript doesn't really have those at all, do you have anything that you've used those for? Actually, so we use them just because we need to use them because Closure Data has them. But we don't want to we don't want to lose information by becoming um, a string. And actually, there's a huge perf win for. So something that's that's surprising is, for example, um, if you use ClojureScript, uh, parsing the, the 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 ridiculously huge representation that I was showing those like 83k or 87k, it's 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 still even in ClojureScript, it's as fast to do the transit read, even though we're constructing a graph of immutable objects. Um, but this is because. We have keywords, and, the, and caching is even better if you have keywords. Because what we can do is when we do the read, we actually have an object cache. So if we encounter a cache code, we don't we don't construct a new object. So when you when you read this massive thing with thousands of records, all the keys are shared. They're all the same object in memory. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so, so this is like a benefit from actually uh, having that as a separate type versus a string. Okay. Okay. Does, it make, does that make sense? Yeah. I guess mostly in closure. <laughs> no, but it's a, it's a closure thing. It's a very yeah. much a closure but that's cool. specific thing. Yeah. What should you get if you send a transit with a keyword in it and try to parse it? And, uh... So if you send a real key, look, JavaScript programmers will never do that. They just won't. But if you were in ClojureScript, you would send a real keyword. So actually, I can, I can show you real quick. But it's an interchange format, right? So. Yeah, but so nobody uses keywords, but like, look, so here's, I, forgot, <laughs> I mean, nobody from JavaScript uses keywords, but we do. But for example, you could go, uh, you can make a keyword like this. So you would never use this thing, but then if I go to tmap and I go um, keyword, and then I go uh, write, So it became a keyword, right? because it was a keyword. It was a keyword object, and we, we encoded it in a special way. Um, again, big be big perk benefits for closure script and, and closure, um, and we don't really. This is a, since that's so specific to closure, we don't expect people to actually construct uh, keywords in JavaScript. It's just you don't not expect them to do that on the server side to communicate back. So we don't because well, the thing that you run into, actually I imagine Ruby people would be like, oh, I can use keywords. But you know, the problem is that everybody gave up, you know? <laughs> they did. Everybody gave up. They were like, ah, we're just going to convert keywords back into strings. You can't round strip them. So, and we're, we're, we're saying no. So you would, you would get one of these, like, uh, t.keyword type. If you actually in Ruby went from keyword to keyword and you sent it over the wire with transit, yes, you would get a keyword type. And would it always be the same? Like, do you keep like a map of these keywords? You know, like, no, is it the JavaScript thing? we can't do interning because so we we would love to do interning. Like, if there was a share, that would be where keywords might be useful in JavaScript because then you can say this is a, this is a thing I want to have intern. So every time I get it, I always have the same exact value. Yeah, so we would love to do interning, but actually, it, it's it's so it requires weak maps, and weak maps are another thing that's in ds 6 But weak maps are not uh, what you call polyfillable. I mean, it requires you know, So in JavaScript, what people often do, they say, here's some type that I that will arrive in the future. And I can provide a simulation of that type. Mm -hmm. But the problem with weak map is it requires integration with the garbage collector for it to work. Yeah. So you, you can't implement it in user land. It must yeah, be. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, so we can't do it. So, so, so that's why you haven't done it. That's okay. why we haven't done it, because there's no there's no way yeah. for us to do it. Because that would be the that would be the Otherwise, yeah, you might need strings. Oh no, we would, we would love to do if we could yeah. do interning, it would be awesome. But we yeah. but we can't. Okay. Cool. So I think uh, probably spoken long enough. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>